to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The walls began to shake. The door of the prison flew open. Right then, a, a prison guard awoke. He realized his own fate, and he started to kill himself. But before he did, he heard these encouraging words. Sir, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And upon the heels of that encouraging statement, the greatest question that's ever been asked comes. Sirs, what must I do? to be saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. We welcome you today to our second part in answering the question, what must I do to be saved? We hope that you've got your Bible with you and that you'll be uh, planning on following along with us as we search the scriptures on this wonderful and such an important topic today. In our last lesson, as we discussed what must I do to be saved, we noted that a person needed to realize that he was lost in sin. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. That that person needs to realize that he cannot, no matter how hard he tries, save himself. There's a way that seems right to a man, the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14.12, and that only by the gospel, the good news of Jesus, Romans 1.16, and obedience to God's commands can one be right with God. And we asked our listeners last time, just as we ask you, in view of the, uh, in view of the gravity and the seriousness of our subject today, would you stop for just a moment and consider your own salvation before we proceed any further? We ask you to think about where were you when you were saved? Were you in a church building? Were you at Christian camp maybe? Were you at home? How old were you? Were you a baby and somebody told you you were saved? Uh, were you 10 or 12 or was it later in life? And then just in your own mind refresh the idea, what did I do by which I knew I was saved? Did somebody tell me to put my hand on the television and I did that? Did I make an altar call? Did I say the sinner's prayer? Just make it clear in your mind exactly where you were and how old you were and what you did when you were saved. And then here's all we ask today. As we open the scripture, we ask you to take what you did, examine that by the word of God. And if the two match, then friend, that's wonderful. If they don't, we urge you to make changes where they're necessary today. And so in the continuation of the question, what must I do to be saved? Last time we noted that the first step in God's plan of salvation is that one must hear the Word of God. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, what does that got to say about hearing being essential? Remember, faith is essential. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. No faith, no pleasing God, right? Well, if I can't please God without faith, then whatever way I get faith is also essential, correct? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing is essential to be saved because I can't get faith without hearing God's Word. And we mentioned in our last lesson that, that hearing the Word of God means more than just, okay, I've heard that and automatically accept it. No, it means I recognize the authority of Jesus in the New Testament. It means I realize I have got to search, I've got to seek, and I've got to prove for myself from the Bible that what I'm being told is true to the will of God. And it means I've got to listen with an ear toward eternity in all seriousness of heart. Now, today we talk about our second step in God's plan of salvation, and that is the Bible teaches we must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Friend, please don't misunderstand. If a person is not willing to believe in Christ, that person cannot be saved. And Jesus said that ever so clearly. I want you to notice with me the words of Jesus 
in John chapter 8, verse number 24. Jesus, as He taught about belief in John 8, 24, said these words, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. Now friend, if a person doesn't believe Christ and believe in Christ, can he be saved? Absolutely not. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot come to the Father without Him, John 14, 6. An example is given in Acts chapter 8 of the Ethiopian eunuch. Here Peter or Philip has been talking to this man about the good news of the gospel from Isaiah 53. He teaches him about Christ. Evidently he teaches him what to do, for in the distance this man sees water and he says, Hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Listen to what Philip said was the condition first. If you believe with all your heart, you may. There's no denying the fact that one absolutely must believe in Jesus to be saved. But friend, I, I hope you'll listen real clearly to this idea as well. Although belief is essential, the Bible never says belief or faith only is what saves. Now there are millions of people who have the idea in their head that all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus and you're saved by faith alone. Friend, can I ask you to consider something with me for just a moment? Did you know that the only time in Scripture the words faith only or faith alone are used, the Bible says the exact opposite of what millions are taught? And that's right. The only, times faith only or the only time faith only or faith alone occurs, the Bible says it's not faith alone that saves. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's look at the Scripture together ourselves. James chapter 2. I want to direct your attention to verse number 24. Notice these words. James says, We see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Justified means that we're just as if I'd never sinned. Are we saying we earn our salvation? Of course not. There are works in the Bible that are just simply commands of God. Did you know belief is a work? John 6 verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He sent. A work from God for us is to believe. Does that mean I've earned my salvation? No, but it is a conditional work that God set forth. Now listen to that verse again. We see that a man is justified by works. Here it is. Only time it occurs in the Bible. And not by faith only or faith alone. Friend, the Bible mentions the words faith only or faith alone one time in the New Testament. And God says you're not saved by faith alone. Along with that idea, there's another false doctrine about salvation that's not found in the Bible either. And that is the sinner's prayer. Multiplied millions of people are told to be saved. You need to say the sinner's prayer. You need to say something like, Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Lord and Savior. I now ask you to come into my heart and save me. Friend, did you know that's not found in the Bible either? Did you know that you can look from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 and you will not find a sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible? It's just not there. Millions of people have been told that, and you don't find it in Scripture. Now, I remember one time I was preaching in a meeting, and I said this exact thing, that you cannot find the sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible. And after the lesson, a, a lady came up to me. She said, Preacher, she said, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer. She was uh, intrigued by that, but she said, You know, I'm going to have to go home and ask my preacher. She said, My pastor said that's so, and I'm going to have to go home and ask my pastor if that's correct. I said, Well, that'd be good. You go home and you ask your pastor or preacher uh, to show you in the Bible where the sinner's prayer is. And if he gives you any verses, Bible verses, you bring those back tomorrow night and we'll talk about them. Well, tomorrow night came. She came in the door and she came up right, right up to me and she said, she said, Preacher, she said, I went home and I asked my preacher about where the sinner's prayer was at in the Bible, about some verses about it. And he said, it wasn't in there. She said, and I told him he's a liar. My well, friend, I just want you to think about that a moment. How many people have been lied to about the sinner's prayer and told to say that for salvation and it's not even in the Bible? You can't even find a sinner's prayer like they're telling you to save any, say anywhere in Scripture? Friend, there's no doubt that belief is essential. 
there's no doubt that we've got to uh, do what God says, but the Bible never teaches belief alone is all that you need to do to be saved. We need to do all the things that God wants us to to be right with Him. And so, first of all, we've got to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Secondly, to be saved. What must I do to be saved? I must believe in Jesus. Unless you believe that I am He, Jesus said, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. Then the Bible teaches that a person must be willing to repent of sin in their life. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, certain people come to Jesus and it's almost like they want to condemn others and elevate themselves as better. And so they've got these examples for Jesus. They say, uh, Jesus, what about these uh, people who had their blood mingle with their sacrifice? What about these people that Pilate killed at the time of the sacrifice? Weren't, didn't, didn't that happen because they were worse sinners than everybody else? Wasn't that God's vengeance? What about these uh, 18 people who were just walking down the road and out of nowhere, nowhere, a tower came and fell on them? Wasn't that the vengeance of God? And wasn't that proof they're worse sinners than everybody else? You know how Jesus answered those two questions? In Luke 13, 3 and in Luke 13, 5, Jesus said to those people who brought the questions, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. What did Jesus teach us about salvation there? That if you won't repent, you're going to be lost. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter told those on the day of Pentecost who cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 3 verse 19, one chapter later, Peter preached in Solomon's portico, repent and turn or repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. I have got to repent if I'm going to be right with God. And friend, when you think about repentance, repentance may require sorrow. And may, sorrow may be a part of repentance, but sorrow alone is not repentance. Just being sorry and crying a few tears is not in and of itself repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Not godly sorrow is repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Well, what then is repentance? In the scriptures, repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. It's a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. How do we know that? Matthew 21 verses 28 through 30. Uh, people, Jesus told this story about people who really were doing the will of God versus those who weren't. He said, a father had two sons. Said to his first son, son go work in my vineyard today. He said he would, but he never did. And then he said to the second son, son go work in my vineyard today. He said he wouldn't. He changed his mind and went back and worked in the Father's vineyard. Which one did the will of the Father? The one who said he would and never did, or the one who said he wouldn't? Changed his way of thinking and changed his way of acting. True repentance is changing your way of thinking and changing your life. Luke chapter 3, verse 8, John said to certain uh, people who came out to be baptized by him just because it was popular and everybody was doing it, John said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And then he said these words, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. True repentance has a fruit. What's that mean? It has a visible attribute from which you can tell someone has changed their life. You can see their life's not like it used to be. They don't talk, they don't act, they don't do, they don't, the things they're a part of, they're not if they're contrary to the will of God, they no longer do those. You can look at their life and tell they have truly repented. And so once I've heard the Word of God and I've believed in Jesus, I must also repent. The Bible also teaches to be saved. I must confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now where's that found at in the Bible? Notice in Scripture, this Scripture with me, Romans chapter 10 Verse number 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
Well, what type of confession are we talking about? Well, we're given an example of that in Acts chapter 8. The conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip tells him, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he says right then and there, with his mouth, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8 verse 34 through 37. Jesus told us that's what we need to do. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. I need to make the good confession, just as Timothy did in 1 Timothy 6, just as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. I've got to orally acknowledge that I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Having done that, friend, the Bible teaches that I must be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of my sins and to be saved. Now, I know there's a lot of confusion in the world about this. I know there's a lot of people who will say, you know, you, you need to believe in Jesus. Yes, you probably need to repent. But they'll also say baptism's not essential. Good to do, something you should do, probably, but not essential to salvation. Friend, the Bible teaches that just like believing, baptism is essential to salvation. Now, let's first ask the question, what exactly is baptism? If you open up Webster's Dictionary today and you look up the word baptism, it might say something like uh, sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. Maybe mention all three of those and it very likely does. Well, is baptism sprinkling or pouring in the Bible? How does the Bible define the word baptism? Friend, there are four passages in the New Testament, which clearly teach that Bible baptism was only by full body immersion. Now, don't take my word for it. Here are the passages that we put before you today to consider. Mark chapter 1, notice verses 9 and 10. The Bible says in Mark 1 verses 9 and 10, And coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. That's at the baptism of Jesus. Now, consider this. To come up, here's, you know, a lot of people ask the question, what would Jesus do? Okay, what would Jesus do concerning the mode of baptism? Question. To come up from, or literally, out of the water, what must you first do? You've got to go down into the water. Jesus wasn't sprinkled, and Jesus didn't have a little water poured on him. He came up out of, from within, is the idea. Jesus was immersed in water. Second passage, John chapter 3, verse number 23. What's the mode of baptism? The Bible says this, John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. How much water does it take to sprinkle a baby? Not much. How much water does it take to pour a little water on somebody's head? Not much. How much water does it take to plunge? To submerge an adult, much water. John was baptizing where there was much water because the biblical mode and definition of baptism is immerse, submerge, or plunge underwater. Another example, Acts 8, verse 37 through 40. You remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road. They come to water. Here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. They stop the chariot. Now watch this. They stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch get down out of the chariot. They both go down into the water. He baptizes him, and they come up out of the water. Why'd they both have to get out of the chariot? Why'd they both have to go down into the water? Why'd they both come out? But there's again an example and a picture of immersion. But here's the clearest verse of all. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul likens baptism to a burial in water. All right, let's think about it now. I want you to think about the last time that you went to a, a funeral at a graveside, to a burial. What they do with that body? Did they take a shovel full of dirt and sprinkle it on top of it? Did they pour a few shovelfuls on it? No. What happens at a burial? They dig a hole in the ground. They place that body completely down in the hole. 
That body's covered on the bottom, it's covered on every side, and then they completely submerge it in the earth. Friend, that's the illustration Paul chose, the Holy Spirit chose, to show us that baptism is a burial, a burial in water with Christ. And so every example we see is that baptism is not by sprinkling or pouring in the New Testament. It was by immersion. Now, let's then talk about the purpose of baptism. What is baptism all about? Why uh, should someone be baptized? Is it just, is it essential? Is it something you have to do? Or is it just something good that you ought to do to follow the example of Jesus, but not necessary for salvation? Well, again, let's not put man's ideas and thoughts into it. Let's just look to the Bible and see. Would you open your Bible to Acts chapter 2, verse number 38 with me? Or notice this verse on the screen. The Bible says that, the Bible teaches that baptism is for the remission of sins. They asked Peter in Acts 2, 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded this way. Peter responded by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, here it is, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, sin separates a man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. God doesn't have a hearing problem. The Lord's arm is not short that he cannot save. God doesn't have a deformed arm that he can't save you. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. What separates man from God? Sin does. Whenever sins are removed, friend, I know I'm back in harmony with God and saved. If baptism removes sin, and if sin separates me from God, then friend, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins and essential. Uh, think about Saul of Tarsus for a minute. Acts 9, verse 4 through 6. Uh, Jesus says to Saul, you go in the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Later, Ananias comes to him, and Paul recounts this in Acts 22, 16. Ananias comes and says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When are sins washed away? The point of baptism, when they're forgiven. Friend, let's also realize this. Not only is baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Baptism is for salvation, meaning baptism, the Bible says baptism is not just something good to do, not something you ought to do after you're saved. Baptism is something you do to be saved. Listen to Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If I don't believe, am I a candidate to be baptized? Well, of course not. Now watch this though. Jesus said, He that believes, watch the conjoining word, and is baptized will be saved. Does the Bible say you must believe and be baptized to be saved? It absolutely does in Mark 16, 16. 1 Peter 3, 21 says the same thing. Listen to how clear this is. Now you talk about clear, this is it. The King James Bible says in 1 Peter 3.21, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, think about that for a moment. If the Bible says, Baptism does now also save us, why in the world would anybody ever say, Baptism is not essential to salvation? Did you know that the Bible also teaches, Baptism is how we get into God's kingdom? John 3, verse 5, to Nicodemus, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you want to be a part of God's kingdom? Do you one day want to go home with God where the kingdom is going? How do I get in the kingdom? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism is also how we get into Christ. Now, let me illustrate the importance of that for you. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, the Bible says, All spiritual blessings are the Christians in Christ. 
And so all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. According to 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, salvation's in Christ. And so if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, and if salvation's in Christ, friend, I really want to know, how does the Bible teach that one gets into Christ? Notice this verse on your screen. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 27, as many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Wait a minute now. How do I get into Christ? As many of us as were baptized into Christ. I can't get into Christ without being baptized. In Christ are all spiritual blessings and salvation. Therefore, it's essential that I get into Christ. Baptism is how I get into God's church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit, we're baptized into one body. Baptism is how I call on the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. Now listen to this now. Baptism is how I contact the blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, that we're buried with Christ in baptism, we die to sin, we're buried with Christ in baptism, and we rise out of the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. Where do I contact the death of Jesus? I'm buried with Christ in baptism. That's where I contact His death. And so friend, here's what we asked you to consider again. We asked you at the outset of this lesson to make fresh in your mind what you did. How old were you? Where were you at? What steps did you take by which you knew you were saved? And then we just ask you to examine that according to the verses we've seen. Does what you did match up with God's plan of salvation that we saw today? If it does, that's wonderful. You can know that you're saved. You can know that you're right with God. But if it doesn't, then friend, we urge you today, we beg you today to make the changes that are necessary. God in heaven loves you and wants you to be saved. We love you and we want you to be saved. If there's something you haven't done that you need to do to get right with God, friend, don't you want to do that before it's too late? Won't you obey the gospel? We hope and pray that you will and that you'll continue to study the gospel with us next time. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.